and we're live uh, hello everyone and welcome back to the afternoon session of this uh, conference at the center for culture sports and events and we're going to continue uh, with the afternoon schedule now and we're beginning with this 45 minute session uh, which we have decided to call places of uh, renewal post pandemic the role of tourism, arts and culture, events and festivals. Uh, I'm uh, Niklas Hell, I'm a PhD student uh, at UWS at the center, uh, which I mentioned earlier, and uh, I am going to moderate this session together with my colleague, Connor Wilson, who's also a PhD student here at the center, and, and he will do most of the actual moderation. Uh, and just as during the morning uh, feel free to leave comments uh, in the comments section and uh, no matter where you're streaming from uh, you will uh, reach us uh, with your comments and questions and we will be able to pick them up later on and uh, this session we will initially take a little graver perspective than the last one uh, and speak a bit about the challenges facing the tourism and event sectors after the on ongoing but now hopefully declining pandemic and we will touch upon the rise of digital festivals and trusts related to physical space, uh, which have been identified as possible obstacles for the thriving pre-pandemic event scene. Uh, we'll, we'll also be discussing the possibilities as well as the future that will, well, um, the, the, pos the possibilities and obstacle that the futures will bring and uh, the new exciting things that have already come into this sector uh, too. So to discuss this, we have invited three uh, practitioners in Scotland working in three different sectors. Uh, and uh, first off, we have uh, Marie Christie, who's the head of development of events industry uh, at Event Scotland, which is the events directorate of Visit Scotland. And she's uh, leading teams with responsibility for a range of things such as uh, event industry development, events and exhibitions, theme years and growth fund. Uh, before their, uh, that work, she was uh, the chief uh, of the international cultural events, uh, also at Event Scotland. Then uh, from Renfrewshire Council, we have Pauline Allen. Uh, she's the events operations manager, uh, and she oversees the development of uh, strategy and creative and uh, the operational delivery of the major ev events taking place in Renfrewshire, including uh, the award-winning Paisley Halloween Festival. And since COVID, she has delivered a series of successful digital events and is now focusing on the post-COVID event strategy and events recovery. And last but not least, we have Mark Mackey, who's the CEO of the promoter Regular Music. Uh, he works in promotion of live culture and music and has done so for three decades. He worked with many of the largest artists and names of their times uh, and our times. And he was recently a key advocate of the refurbishment and relaunch of Glasgow's iconic Kelvin Grove bandstand venue. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, leave the word to my colleague, Connor. Connor, we can't, we can't hear you, Connor. Um, okay, so sorry for that, uh, yes,
Okay, uh, so uh, we will start off by uh, letting the different participants here um, speaking a bit, uh, um, a bit uh, their minds about a few of the questions. We have uh, three categories of questions. We will be speaking uh, firstly about the futures of festivals and tourism in this post-pandemic setting that we're uh, uh, approaching and uh, whether we have uh, approached uh, what has been called peak events theory uh, in the in the event studies literature which is basically a theory that that we have reached a peak of uh, the amount of events that that we can kind of handle or which is going to be popular and i'd uh, like to start off by asking uh, marie uh, what do you think the the future is of festivals and tourism and have we reached uh, a peak event <laughs> Um, afternoon everyone, thanks for inviting me along to be part of the panel today. So um, have we reached peak? Well, events and festivals are an important part of Scotland's future. Events are recognised to be strong contributors to our social, cultural and economic health and there's an increasing recognition that the benefits of participating in social and cultural events are really important for our well-being and our mental health. So it's important that we continue to work in partnership in Scotland to support and advocate for our events and festival sector and continue to build Scotland's reputation as the perfect stage for events. There is, however, no denying that the pandemic has been particularly hard on the events and festival sector. It's effectively been illegal for the vast majority of live events to operate over the past year. And many livelihoods have been significantly compromised or lost. And there's a fear that the sector may have lost many skilled workers who simply had to look elsewhere for a living. Even with easing, the majority of events are still not financially viable. In level two, which is where many of our local authorities remain at the moment, only um, uh, 500 people are permitted in outdoor seated open space. And if standing, that's reduced to 250. Indoors, only 100 people are permitted. When we go to the lowest level, level zero, which is in the, the, um, the plan for return to events, we go to 2,000 outdoor seated, 1,000 outdoor standing, and just 400 indoors, all with two metres distancing in place. Now, anyone can see that these are significant challenges and the sector is only really viable when it can operate without physical distancing. So getting to that point in Scotland and providing the relevant support in the meantime is what's absolutely essential for the sector. So you asked about peak event period, maybe that's academic speak, um, but I don't believe we're past peak event period. Um, events and festivals are an important part of Scotland's DNA. We have our world-class festival city in Edinburgh. Glasgow is a celebrated international event host with its treasured annual events such as Celtic Connections and GI. And we have unique annual events in every part of the country, such as Wigtown Book Festival, Fintorn Bay Arts Festival, Port Soy's Traditional Boat Festival, and of course, Paisley's growing um, Halloween Festival. And we have many regular sporting events from the Scottish Open to the Loch Ness Marathon. So there's around three to 400 annual events and festivals that take place across Scotland each year. And these events are important for our economies, our tourism ecosystem, they provide opportunities and platforms for artists, creatives and athletes, and opportunities for us to come together for, with friends and families for the joy of shared experiences. And I know for one, I've certainly been missing that over the past year. I also believe there's a huge appetite for the return of events and festivals, which is demonstrated when tickets actually can go on sale. And recent research that was published at the end of last month from the live music industry showed the demand for live music events had actually grown with about 85% of their 25,000 sample saying they intended to attend at least the same, probably more events than they had pre-pandemic, with the youngest being the keenest and the eldest not deterred. Um, so as more tickets are released across different types of events, we'll be able to see which audiences are actually the keenest and if any are actually deterred in the short term and why. But the return, it's not going to be easy. Um, even when we're through physical distancing, the funding landscape alone is likely to be extremely challenging with huge pressures on local authorities and national agencies and sponsors. 
I also think there'll be changes emerging from this pandemic um, with a focus on well-being, environmental sustainability, digital innovation and responsible tourism coming very much to the fore, both from a funders and an audience perspective. But I think that's also positive. Practicalities will also mean that at least in the short term, events with traditionally international audiences are likely to focus more on relationship with domestic audiences for live experience and to keep connections with international audiences through online content and relationships if they can. So for me to summarise, yes, there is a future. It will take account of what we've been through and I believe the audience appetite will be greater than ever. Uh, Connor is still silent, so uh, I'll just go on. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks for that, Marie. Uh, and uh, and uh, I do believe you have many good points. But you, uh, Pauline, I'm sure that you have a very practical hands-on perspective on the amount of, of people being able to join in on events. What's your what's your take on this uh, this issue? Hi, thank, thank you for having me along. Um, echo, I'm not sure how I could follow, Mar follow Mary, but um, echo everything that, you, that you've said. Um, certainly here in, in Renfrewshire, there's a, a real desire for events to return. We've, we're, we're actively trying to get them back on the calendar, discussing events. We're going to do it on with, with Mark. Um, we're working with Mark on an event later on this year, but in terms of have we passed the, the peak of events, I really don't think so. I think it's um, culture and creativity that's got people through this this pandemic. Well, from the the window displays that were done to the doorstep battering of pans, mimicking music from from the kind of outset, um, people are really missing the connectivity with with people. So I don't I don't think in any way we've we've passed the peak of events. There there was a, an explosion of festivals and things going on and um but all the ticket all the tickets were selling people people were still making making money from it pre pre covid um as Maddie said the only thing that i think we we normally set targets against how many visitors we would get out with the the Renfrewshire area um, and our strategy we changed our objectives this year um and it's about bringing people back in local people back into the town center building confidence within people to return to events and supporting our, our local businesses. So we've kind of, we've taken it back to, to really localising things, um, but with the view to taking it back to, to where it was before. Um, we were we were setting a target of 40% of people coming from out with our, our region. And hopefully we will get back to that sometime soon, but we know it will take time to build up. Um, but I, I go on all the local forums and have a wee look at everything that's going on event wise. And pe for, from what I can see, people are people are desperate to get back out and get get into things. As you saw, when England are obviously a wee bit of a hit, wee bit ahead of us, but when they released their tickets, they were all selling out like instantly. People were people were clamouring to get them. So no, from from my point of view personally, and from what I can see from from people, I, I, I think when when we can get back to some sort of normal event, not not two meter physical physical distancing, then I think we'll see people back out and about and, and enjoying themselves. Great. Uh, thanks, Pauline. Uh, and um, uh, Mark, uh, I'm sure that you have a, an industry perspective on this, uh, being uh, the person who needs to kind of uh, to sell the tickets in order to, to live. Uh, in a way, so what's your perspective on this whole uh, peak events and and the the future of live culture? Oh, sorry, we can't hear you, Mark. That'll be why I've switched on now. Afternoon, everybody, and um, thanks for for inviting me along this afternoon. Um, yeah, there's been loads of interesting points brought up already um, by Marie and and, and Pauline, um, and. Uh, you know, I, I just think it's difficult to sum up because the, the, the events are so varied in, in, in their nature, their audience, that you know, the demographic, etc. But I think the one thing is is that, and I'm a strong believer that events and participation cannot be replicated online or in any other format, and it's the whole experience, it's the day out, 
as mixing with friends, going to see um, an exhibition, going to see a, a theatre show, going to see a rock concert, going to a golf tournament. All these things, you know, there's social events, there's where we get involved with our friends and family, etc. And and that experience can never be replicated. That's why in the industries we are in, we're on to a winner, you know? And okay, we've had to take a wee setback here because of the pandemic. But as everybody says, when this has blown over and it will be over at some point, we will we will come back bigger and stronger than ever, I believe. So I've never heard this expression peak <coughs> um, practice, whatever it is, um, peak events. Um, that's a new one on me. Um, and not that I'm a, a fan of market forces. However, um, if you go back 30, 40 years when I started in this industry, there were very few events. Um, in fact, there were virtually none in terms of uh, from rock concerts. There'd be one major rock concert a year per in Scotland. That would be it. You know, it would be us putting you two on at Parkhead or us putting REM on at Murrayfield or, or, or something like that. There were very, very few uh, events of, of that scale in music, outdoor summer things going on. And when we fast forward 35 years or whatever, I'm really heartened to see the variety of different events. And, and it's the way that um, events evolve naturally. You know, people try something out and then they think, well, you know, we didn't get it all right that year. Let's tweak it a bit and try and improve it. And then it, it beds into local culture. And all good events organically grow like that. And that gives them longevity. Um, so for all of these events that are all over Scotland, and we all know who they are, um, they will bounce back because they've got the roots firmly bedded into the community. Um, and I love what Pauline says about local. The one good thing about the pandemic, I think, is I think we all have to appreciate what's going on in our doorstep more often, try and support those events, you know, as well as travel further afield, etc. But if there's something on in your local area, grab it. Um, and also back to referring back to what Mary said in, in, in the at the beginning. <clears throat> One of the most important things for a lot of people that hasn't really been pushed or brought up, I know it's been mentioned a few times, is well-being and mental health and the benefits that these events and days out bring to people. It's not just the day out itself. It's like for four months before, you're looking forward to it. You're making plans for it. You're chatting to friends about you know how you're going to do this or that or the next thing or it's a weekend away to a festival in Dumfries and Galloway or you're going up to Hebkelt and or you know whatever you know um, on Isla Lewis there, there's many different uh, ways that we all participate in these things uh, but the key is we do it together as a community I think and and that's the one thing as a fan of a band for example just to pin it back down to when we see our favorite artists on stage we're all we're all applauding and cheering on we're all in unison with what's going on and sharing that shared experience is something we can never replicate and uh, we can talk about that later on about the digital stuff which i'll poo poo later on but um anyway that's enough as my intro and uh, speak later okay i'm going to try i think that you can be hearing me now yeah okay yeah brilliant uh, for time lucky um thank you everyone um already i'm seeing um, some common themes and the sort of what I would take to be a common denunciation that we have reached peak event. Um, I think this, this sort of sense I'm getting is that we all seem to think that events go back stronger than ever was the, the sort of sense I got there. Um, but Mark has, I think, set it up quite nicely for a transition into question two. But um, just before we do, um, please keep your questions um, coming in through the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so Mark, I'm guessing, is not a massive fan of digital events, but nonetheless, our, our second question is, um, what will it, what impact will the rise of digital events have on in-person attendance? Um, obviously, during the pandemic, I think as Pauline had mentioned, um, there was a massive rise of, of online streamed events. A lot of them were often paid as well. So I guess it's just to get some comment on, are these events here to stay and how will the impact of physical in-person events if we could keep the same order as last time then so we could start with marie um 
Thanks, Connor. Nice to hear you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's an interesting one, this. I think the rise of digital events, it wasn't a natural phenomenon. It wasn't a natural progression of the event model due to a pressing audience demand for digital. Because as a response to COVID-19, the events industry looked at new ways to stay connected with their audiences, to keep their brands alive and to survive. Um, almost overnight, those that could adapted their in-person events to online editions and events were transformed and reimagined. New formats were created, new technologies were harnessed and innovative solutions were found. Not all events were able to pivot in this way, of course, and not all, um, for example, had funding in place that could be redirected into um, delivering that kind of activity. However, I do believe that events, maybe not all, but events will embrace an increasingly hybrid format going forward. Um, online events for me certainly filled a void during the pandemic, um, simply because our ability to engage with live experiences were obviously limited. And all the research shows that there has been a high engagement during the pandemic because people were desperate for some culture and creativity and outlet um, in, their, in their lives. Um, and I do think that research is showing that there is a desire for continued high quality digital content going forward. However, it's my view that um, this will add to the experience of live events and in no way replace it. So I guess those events that were able to pivot to provide some kind of digital offer over the past year might have experienced benefits of being able to create stronger digital content and streaming and where viable inevitably they're going to take some of those learnings forward into the future and you know certainly as an audi audience development tool in terms of keeping in contact with audiences in between festivals developing new audiences both domestic and international and trying to monetize digital content to develop new income streams um, some of our major festivals um, are developing excellent digital content as part of hybrid, hybrid events for this summer. Um, and for example, um, you probably all noted the International Book Festival digital programme last year, which was pretty amazing. In a really short time frame, they turned around about 150 um, live streamed events, which were later available on demand. And there was no limit to online numbers. The events were free. Donations were successfully encouraged as were book sales. The program was really excellent and it encouraged a, a huge number of views. And, you know, for that festival, I'm pretty sure they will be taking the learnings from that experience, which obviously they didn't design and, and they sort of, you know, innovated and responded to the situation. But it's really um, interesting. I think they've got a really smart approach for this year's Edinburgh International Book Festival, which is up at the Edinburgh College of Art. They've got indoor and outdoor spaces. They've got, I think, about three broadcast studios and at least a couple of those will accommodate live audiences. They have a festival site. It's the kind of things that you would usually expect at the book festival. So I think they've got a really smart approach for this year, but it is for this year and for the context that we're planning into and delivering into. So, of course, for some events, some are more flexible than others, and some events may not translate particularly well into good digital experiences. And I think, um, were you talking about a distrust of physical space, or is that is that later on? Yeah, that um, is our, our next question, I believe. All yeah. right, okay, I'll come back to that. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, that, that, that's what I'm feeling with the ride of digital events. I think it's it's something that wasn't you know natural. But the event sector being so creative has really learned and that learning and innovation has been escalated where that's been able to be supported or it's been financially viable. So I definitely think there'll be lessons. But as Mark said earlier, there's nothing replaces a live event experience. You can enhance it. You can increase audiences. You can you know, do all sorts of things to enhance your festival model if, if it's financially viable or supported. But I don't think it replaces it in any way. Brilliant, thanks, uh, Marie. Um, what about you, Pauline? Hi. Yeah, well, we, we ran a number of digital events. We were fortunate that some of our funding stayed in place. So the first event we ran was our Small Shop Festival, which normally takes place the first Saturday in July. And we were a wee bit scratching our heads to begin with because the main focus of that is a large scale parade um, and the purpose of it is engagement and participation. 
Um, but we put together, we've managed to put together a full programme, took, took all the elements or the main elements that we could of um, Small Shop Date and put it out. And it was really successful. It went out the weekend, it was in July last year, and it went out at the weekend just as things were starting to open back up slightly. But we still got really good, really good numbers on it. Since then, we have produced another couple of um, events. We did one for Christmas, like up Renfrewshire, which basically just showcased all of the light switch ons that we would normally put on. There was no switch on events. The lights went on, they were filmed, and we had some performances. Um, in between that, we also did a, a film for Remembrance Day, spoke to all the towns and villages that would normally have their own service. So we were able to capture some of the things that are really important to, to our local people. But since then, we, we then did the food festival this year in April, and we noticed from, from the Christmas event to the food festival, there's a real shift in how many people actually want to sit and watch these events. There's a real, there's been a dip, definite dip. Um, and obviously, this year's small shot event is at, at an in-between time. We thought we were going to be able to go back out and do something physical, and we're still not quite sure just for the format of the event that it is, what we can do. So we're doing a bit of both. We're doing some physical things in the town centre, but we've also put together a digital programme. And for this year, we're not. Last year, we put it out as a full programme, something on at 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, and it was a timed event trying to replicate what an event would, would have been. But this year, we're just going to put it all out because what we've noticed is people don't want to sit at 5 o'clock and watch a particular thing. They want to watch it when they've got time to watch it or when they choose to watch it. Um, so we're still doing digital this year, but we've got a bit physical. But long term, long term digital is not 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 a replacement of a physical event, as as both Mark and Mary have said. The, I've said from the beginning the, the taste, the sound, the smell, everything of an event. You, you just you can't you can't replicate it on a screen. Um, I did a couple of, personally, I did a couple, went to a couple of live paid for streamed gigs and I was thinking, well, what are these going to be like? And one of them was okay, there was a bit of interaction, but no, nah, it just, it didn't do it, didn't do it for, for me. Um, but what I would say is some of the programme that we've put together, we've been able to, to reach people, elderly people and people who wouldn't be able to come out and and enjoy events for for whatever reason people who no longer live in the area are still really keen on the stories and things that come that come from Renfrewshire. so we will continue to produce a digital element but it will be it will be much smaller than what it is the focus will be on on the outdoor event but we have made a commitment going forward that there will be a digital strand in on our programming Thanks, Pauline. Again, I'm already seeing some sort of common themes coming through here. Um, I'll just, I'm slightly aware of time, so I'll just quickly go to Mark rather than take up the time by me sort of rambling on. So, Mark, uh, what do you think? Hi, Connor. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I would agree with uh, what both Murray and uh, Pauline have said in terms of hybrid might be the future. You know, I'm not saying get rid of digital altogether, I'm not anti digital. Um, just in, in my sector, um live concerts on telly i mean they're a bit boring and uh, uh, that's it basically <laughs> and uh, uh also if i want to engage with some some art sky arts is a great channel i can watch really expensively produced shows on art however things like the book festivals that marie mentioned that's fantastic i mean getting up close with an author uh, and then being able that translates that comes over especially in your local area they're talking about uh, if it's relevant to scotland especially with scottish writers and things like that and i applaud all of that and digital to be used to engage with your festival's audience and um not educate them but to bring them on board to bring them closer on board and for them to be more involved in a hybrid way is great but to make the event happen we still need them to turn up in person Brilliant, thank you. Um, so if we could just quickly go on to our last question. Um, and again, if you've got any questions, please um, drop them below. Um, so sort of following on from that then, um, what are the possible long-term effects of distrust of physical space and increased non-place attendance? Um, so again, if we could start with Marie. Um, I thought that was interesting when you sent us the questions, distrust of physical space. <laughs> I think for me that only exists as long as physical space carries risk. 
Um, so once that risk is mitigated, I don't think there'll be a lasting distrust of um, gathering in a physical space that will mean we all want to crowd around our computers and watch gigs on screen rather than actually having real life experiences. Um, you know, we don't at the minute want to take any risks with our own health, let alone anybody else's. So, you know, even research that's undertake right now, it's, it's with people's frame of mind as it is right now. You know, if someone was to ask me, you know, do you want to attend a, a kind of shoulder to shoulder event with 20,000 people? Um, I, I'm, I might say yes, but I'm getting my second jab tomorrow. So I might say yes, because I'm getting my second jab. Do you know what I mean? And um, so I think once that perceived danger of a gathering is lifted, I think audiences will return to events and many events will have developed more advanced and sophisticated ways to also extend their audiences and add value to the audience experience through live streamed or recorded digital content, creating that hybrid offer we've been talking about. Um, I don't agree there'll be increased non-place attendance, if that's the right term, in the longer in the longer term. We're living through an enforced situation due to the pandemic at the moment. Um, so nothing that I'm seeing indicates that post-pandemic and in the longer term, most people will want to experience events online. It's human nature to want to come together and experience arts and sports and your passion with your friends and your family and other like-minded people. However, I would say, just to sort of finish, if you were correct, which I sincerely hope that that assertion isn't, I would be very concerned about the loss of live events and festivals and what that would mean to Scotland and our community socially, culturally and economically and from a well-being perspective. Um, you know, our experience shows that major events bring huge pride and confidence and all sorts of benefits to at a national level, but events come in all shapes and sizes and they enable people to come together to watch or participate as a community. And while small community events don't perhaps have the significant economic impact that um, larger events do, they're really important socially and culturally. And Scotland's national performance framework outlines a vision to create communities that are inclusive, empowered, resilient and safe. And local pride and appreciation of an area are closely linked to feelings of attachment and a sense of belonging, which in turn bring that community cohesion. So for me, community events are an important part of building that sense of place and sort of community togetherness and cohesion so not only do i disagree that long-term audiences will have a distrust of physical space um but should that be a possibility we'd lose too much so we need to ensure that it doesn't happen thanks me uh, i thought that was a really interesting answer i suppose um i think you're absolutely right that you know the pandemic will be over at some point and you'd like to think that and you know 10 years from now we won't still be in socially distanced online events but i suppose the more interesting question then becomes that one of transition isn't it so obviously there won't be the pandemic won't disappear overnight and we're going to have to start opening up events whilst the pandemic is still a real issue for people so i guess a, a sort of alternate phrase maybe how we manage that transition and get people to start coming back out to events um what about you pauline in terms of the, the the first point about distrust of physical space, I think in Braintree here we saw the minute the, the farmer's market was allowed to start trading again, we there was buskers out in the town and it, it was queued out. We actually had to stop it trading because there wasn't security and people in place in the first weekend. We had to come up with a, another solution. So I don't think there's going to be a, a distrust. I think people, the minute they see something, they're latching on to it. And, and getting out there um but in terms of transitioning into to events what what we're doing here in Renfrewshire um so as I mentioned before Halloween is is one of our um, biggest events and we don't want and the spree as well that we work with on Mark we don't want to we don't want to lose that for this year so we're we're putting in place a couple of options that allows both of those events to run albeit in a different way but still in a way that people can come con Come out physically and still experience something. We've not released too much about it, so I don't want to say too much about it. But we have, we have plans there to. And that's how we're going to start kind of step changing, opening, opening things up. So it will still be the same brand, but it will be a slightly different experience this year with the hope to build, build on and on into future years. Right. Thanks, Pauline. Uh, just what about you, Mark? I'm interested to hear your perspective as someone that runs sort of live music events, which are going to be one of the more difficult ones to get back to 
20,000 people standing shoulder to shoulder. Um, what's your perspective? Well, um, Conrad, I think events won't start up again until it's safe to do so. Therefore, our audiences should be reassured by government allowing events to take place that they're going to be in a safe area. I think in the transition period, and let's hope the transition period is a matter of weeks or a month or two, you know, it shouldn't be long before people get back into the way of going to events as it is safe to do. Otherwise, the events would not be allowed to take place. The minute the lights go down at the Barrowlands, people are going to surge to the front and it's business as usual because we're social beasts, we, you know, and, and that's why we, we buy tickets for going to gigs at the Barrowland or whatever else. But no, I, I think there's, there's a certain audience uh, density that's required. Now, you know, when we talk about two metres, I know the Edinburgh Festival is running some tents on the edge of town with two metres social distance event, you know, audiences. Now, to me, I mean, there's physical distance, there's... Um, but I, I sort of call that one emotional distance. It's too far. I mean, we have to bring people together. Um, so the transition period hopefully will only be this summer or, you know, whenever. We have to get out of the trans The transition period has got to be as short as possible and public confidence will quickly come back because it will be seen to be safe to do so as well. So I, th I, think, we're, I think we'll be in a good place, but when we're ready. Great. Um, thank you. I should mention that um, I've noticed a few uh, answers have sort of touched on the, the theme of well-being. Um, just to mention that the next session will deal more specifically um, with the theme of, sort of mental health and well-being during the pandemic. So make sure that you are sticking around for that one. And um, we have had a couple of questions. We've only got just over five minutes left. Um, both are sort of focused more mainly on the sort of digital um, event. Um, one goes, um, might there be a generational dimension to how people feel about accessing and experiencing events online? Um, can increased, uh, can increasing accessibility... Um, sorry, the questions just disappeared. Yeah, what can be done to increase accessibility for events? And I know it's interesting that Pauline had mentioned as well, almost kind of the opposite of that, where some people have been able to access online events where they couldn't do it in person with sort of older people. Um, does anyone want to come in on this question? Um, the question, it's about the generational um, dimension. I mean, obviously, um, the younger of society are, are generally, you can only speak generally, more a fee with, um, you know, digital technologies. But certainly, you know, my, um, my mother and um, et cetera have no problems accessing. But there's also an economic, not everyone has access to a computer, the internet, all of that. But I suppose it depends what you're talking about, what kind of it's accessibility. It could be that um, more uh, digital content helps people that couldn't perhaps afford the full price of a ticket to get a flavour of it. It could be that people that are not physically able to attend a particular kind of event can um, can experience some element of that festival. So there's different sorts of accessibility that you'd be that you'd be looking at. But I do think it's going to be a massive learning curve, you know, through this transition period and into hopefully a, a new um uh you know, the, the, the new normal for whatever events and festivals are going to look like. So all these things will have to be considered because accessibility is clearly important for, for any festival to reach its broad audiences. Yeah, I think we've also had another comment. Um, it's important to remember the positive unintended consequences of digital events for often excluded audiences, um, health and disabilities and people sort of maybe aren't confident as well. So there is, I suppose, an interest in to be had about uh, accessibility. Um, I suppose we only have five minutes left, but I would like to briefly speak about the visitor economy and what we think the future is for the visitor economy might be um, at a period of sort of impaired and reduced international travel. Would anyone like to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll come in, uh, Connor. Um, there's a, a lot of... Um, uh, research has been done in the UK and Scotland on music tourism and it is a, 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 a growing market. Um, people 
you know, you don't come to the UK on holiday for the weather, you know. Um, you don't come, you come for the culture, you know. You want to, because to, you, you can't be guaranteed the weather. It's not like going to a Greek island and you know what you're going to be doing for two weeks. So when you come to the UK and especially Scotland, you've got the combination of, well, brilliant scenery and food, etc. all of that culture, as well as the art forms, and that includes music. And um, we are seeing, you know, and we, we, we get, it's amazing on some concerts, um, when you look at the postcodes, you can find out actually 10% of this audience is not from Scotland. And you go, wow, no, that's that's a high one. You know, that'll be in midsummer at one of our Edinburgh Castle concerts or something like that. Uh, or at the summer nights at the bandstand, where we can get ten percent of non-Scots coming to 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 the to the, the shows. Um, so music tourism, yeah, onwards and upwards. Um, um, international, that'll be back soon enough. But while we can't go internationally, maybe in the next few years, if travel international travel is going to be a hassle, maybe more people from England and Wales and Ireland will come to Scotland for two weeks and dip their toe in different festivals that are around Scotland and come and see some shows. So it can be a good thing and we should try and work on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose what I would, I would be interested to hear how that ties into a sort of more hybrid model for events as well, particularly how that might bring in the online events. Um, I'd be interested to hear how you may be able to use hybrid, uh, hybrid models to sort of try and keep in touch with international audiences. Um, I'd be interested to hear maybe about the book festival that Marie was talking about, but I'm also aware that the, the Paisley Book Festival um, had a large online contingent as well. Um, is there anyone that could say anything just a little bit about that? Um, well, uh, well, I guess it's just to say that all good online content, um, you know, some of the information that I'm seeing coming back from, um, you know, events that have been delivered digitally, they are reaching um, broader audiences. So I think I touched on earlier the opportunity for um, digital content to, to develop audiences. But in doing that, you know, you're not just reaching audiences so that they can enjoy that content at that point. You're hopefully encouraging them that actually they really want to experience the destination where that comes from and, you know, experience that whole atmosphere of being in the city and um, or wherever the event is and just enjoying the Scottish hospitality and, and that kind of broader experience. So I think, you know, as I said earlier, um, digital content should be a way to develop audiences and I think therefore um, you know there there are wins to be had there. Brilliant. Um, I'm aware that we are just about out of time. Um, I wonder if we've maybe got time for another quick question but I'm not sure that we do. Um, so Connor, I just wanted to, to add just to add on to, to that that question. And um, we've we've tried to bring people to events who don't who wouldn't traditionally come along people from care homes or, or groups who maybe don't feel like coming along to a Spiegel tent at an, at an event is necessarily for them, but getting them out into the to the experience. And, and that, there's been challenges with that. Some people have come back and said, we've provided transport, we've provided free tickets, we've done loads of things and there's still, still kind of issues around it. So this year we're going to try and go back the way and take some of the event out, back out to them um, through digital, digital and physical so that's that's a kind of we've never done digital back kind of out the way to specific groups and tailored it to to their needs so we're looking at that for some of our programs i think that's a wee bit of a different different take on it as well yeah okay so uh, i think we've got another couple of minutes if you are all okay to say i'm sure we've uh, all got um a lot in the diary as things start to open up again um i suppose something i wanted to pick up on from earlier um and I suppose just to sort of go back to this idea of distrust of a uh, public space. I know we had, I think each of the three panel members had mentioned that we are looking at a sort of massive demand for events when they do come back. I'd be interested to see just how we get there. So how long, should, how do we get to events opening back up and what is the time scale looking like for the future? If we could start with Marie and maybe hear a little bit from each of the panel members just to finish us off. 
Well, um, there, there's a lot of information. That's quite a big question in terms of the time scale for getting back. Um, if anyone's interested, they can find all the guidance and updates from the Events Industry Advisory Group, which is an industry group that um, you know, feeds into Scottish Government in terms of the route map back to events. Um, so you can go on to um, visitscotland.org forward slash events or eventsscotland.org. Um, then you should be able to find more information about exactly where we are. And also it, it might be an idea um, if folk aren't signed up to the Event Scotland newsletter, which you can get through the same route, um, because we send updates in terms of the discussion that has happened at the Events Industry Advisory Group, also any new guidance, new opportunities or research or anything like that. So um, if um, folks that are listening today aren't across that, that is a good route to um, be connected into for all that kind of return to events guidance. We don't have a date with no for no social distancing at this point. That That's the obvious point right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about you, Pauline? I think just to touch on the previous answer, I'd said that we've kind of got a plan in place for, for some of our events where we'll have elements of it that can go ahead regardless of distancing measures that might be in place. But should those measures come back down, then we can quickly put on other elements to the event. And we've we've decided um, on one particular event this year just to take a risk, a, the, the financial risk basically on that and um, some things that we need to book now to make them happen. Um, we've, we've decided to take a, a bit of a, a calculated risk on that to, to allow people to get the experience because we're still quite positive that we'll be able to do it and somehow even if even if we're potentially at one meter physical distance we'll be able to put on some experience so that's that's what we are doing all right um mark do you have anything else you'd like to add to this um are we there yet you know, <laughs> we can't, it sounds like a bunch of, <coughs> pardon me, kids in the back of the car saying, are we there yet? <clears throat> None of us have a crystal ball. <coughs> and something I'm, I I learned and heard 18 months ago, at the start of this, 16 months ago, was, <coughs> and some advice I would spread, pass on, is don't try and second guess this virus or the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> all we can be is ready for when we get this, the, the, the green light. And uh, so that's all I would say. We will be ready when the time is ready. Yes, thanks, Mark. And I feel like that feels like a, a very nice note to end on as well. So I'd like to thank our panel <coughs> members, Colin, uh, Marie and Mark, for joining us this afternoon. Um, and I know this has been a, a really interesting discussion, so I'd just like to give a quick plug for another event that's been held through the School of Business and Creative Industries on the 23rd of June. It'll be held on the same platform as you're watching on just now, and it will be the Future of Events panel, which will touch on some, some quite similar themes as today. Um, thank you, everyone, um, and thank you to everyone who's watched the session from whichever platform you've watched it on as well. Thank you.